Hello, I've decided to make a video on the costumes in the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them films. The Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them films are a prequel of sorts to the Harry Potter movies. They follow Newt Scamander as he travels through America and in the second movie, Paris. He meets Jacob Kowalski, Tina Goldstein, and Queenie Goldstein, and I will be talking about their costumes. The costumes in the Harry Potter franchise in general are interesting, as in the books, it said that wizards have a hard time typically fitting into the muggle or not magical world because they wear very uh, wizard clothes. In the movies, the characters tend to follow these rules most of the time. Characters like the Weasleys or Bellatrix Lestrange, they don't really wear clothes that you would see out the, on the street really. Um, the exception seems to be the younger characters like Harry or Hermione or Ron who do wear normal teenage clothes and seem to be fine with it. But for the most part, wizards don't wear normal people clothes. In the Fantastic Beasts and Beasts, the witches and wizards actually don't really follow this rule and they dress in time period appropriate 1920s style. This makes sense in the first movie where the witches and wizards are afraid of being found out. There's a very long backstory. It's not great, but they don't want to be found out, so they wear clothes to blend in and they do so pretty well. However, in the second movie, this makes less sense when you realize that they don't need to do that, and yet they are still wearing very fashionable 1920s clothes. It doesn't make very much sense, but it is one of the many plot inconsistencies in the wizarding world. Uh, Thank you, J.K. Rowling. Speaking of J.K. Rowling, I'm aware she is not a great person. Um, don't like her, support her, so don't worry. It just makes me feel less bad about criticizing these movies. Colleen Atwood is the costume designer for both of the Fantastic Beasts films. She actually won an Oscar for the first one. She's been nominated for 12 Academy Awards for Best Costume Design and has won four of them. Obviously, the Oscars aren't exactly a judgment of the best talent, but it does mean that she's clearly good at something. She's doing something right. When creating the costumes, Atwood wanted to create outfits that were still recognizable as from the 1920s period, but that still were accessible to the modern day audience, which is what most uh, period pieces tend to do. She tried to capture the mood of the period after World War One and with the new social changes and tried to capture especially New York and the diversity of the people there and how it would have maybe felt back in the 1920s, but with magic. The 1920s were right after the First World War as well as both the 18th and 19th Amendment. With the alcohol ban backfiring and white women finally being allowed the right to vote, the 1920s were a time of a lot of change all around the world, but especially in the US. Fashion represented this change, with hemlines rising um, to below the knees and waistlines dropping. A lot of women cut their hair and began to wear makeup, which was a little bit more socially acceptable now. And we can sort of see this in the costumes in Fantastic Beasts. Atwood would start with a design and then sort of change it depending on what it was needed for, special effects, fight scenes. With Newt's coat, he stands up and sits down a lot, so she had to make sure it stayed looking the best it could while he was moving around a lot. She used a lot of real period pieces from all over the world and looked at photos from around the time, including photographers like Man Ray and Bernice Abbott. While the movie is set in 1926, Atwood actually took a lot of inspiration from the early 1930s, especially from Madeleine Vionnet, who was credited with inventing the bias cut, which was popular in the 20s and 30s. We can see it a lot in the costumes in Fantastic Beasts. Before I start, I'm not as knowledgeable in men's historical fashion as I am in women's historical fashion, so I'll probably focus a little bit more on Queenie and Tina's costumes than Newt or Jacob or any of the other men in the film's costumes. Newt's commander is the main character of the Fantastic Beasts movies, like I already said. He wears a white shirt, a brown gold vest, a bow tie, a suit, and a blue coat. He also wears a striped Hufflepuff scarf in one of the scenes. Atwood chose a blue coat for Newt so that he would be set apart from the rest of the people on the streets of New York, but he wouldn't look completely out of place. The colors of his costume also correlate or sort of resemble the creatures that he loves so much. The blue coat, which Atwood calls a peacock color, also has a ton of pockets in it, although we don't really see most of them because 
they are mostly on the inside of the coat. It's still cool to see the thought that went into designing his costume. Atwood wanted him to look like he belonged in the time period, but he still had something unique about him, magical. He comes from England, like I already said, which is why his costumes are not as well blended in with the 1920s um, America as maybe a lot of the other characters might be. In the entire first movie, Newt actually never changes his outfit, he just takes off his coat or his jacket. In the second movie, Newt wears almost the exact same thing, except the coat is a little bit grayer, it's kind of darker to sort of reflect the darker tone of the film, which we will see in pretty much every other character. I had the most trouble finding anything about Jacob's costumes, but I still thought I should talk about him because he is one of the main characters. Jacob Kowalski is the first friend that Newt makes when he comes to New York. He works at a cannery, but he wants to open a bakery. He has three outfits throughout the entire movie. His first one is a suit, and then a work uniform, and then another suit. The suit that he wears for the majority of the movie is the suit that he wears when he tries to get a loan from the bank. He wants to look presentable, um, and it's actually possible that he may have rented or borrowed this suit, as it doesn't quite match, and it also doesn't fit him very well. Like Newt, Jacob also wears a white shirt and a suit, but his is um, darker colors, less magical, I suppose. And he also doesn't wear a coat, which maybe he can't afford. Jacob also doesn't wear a hat, which I can excuse Newt for not doing because he doesn't quite know how to dress like everybody else in the not magical world. But Jacob should probably be wearing, probably be wearing a hat because he's from the 1920s. Men in the 1920s usually wore hats. We also see Jacob in his cannery work uniform, which is very obviously supposed to look sad and boring, it's this dark color. Along with the other men's sort of uniforms, it does look pretty close to what I believe men in that time period would actually wear to work in a factory like this. He wears one last outfit, which you don't really get to see much of, but it's a similar white shirt and a vest. He also has a pattern tie and a baker's apron. The clothes are a little bit nicer, so we can assume that Jacob's bakery has been doing well. In the second movie, Jacob's clothes continue to be nicer. They fit him and match, and he has a coat now. Poor Bettina Goldstein, which is actually her name by the way, or just Tina Goldstein, is my favorite character in the movie. Her clothes are mostly muted colors, blues, grays, and some white. Women's fashion in the 1920s was actually occasionally influenced by more masculine fashion, and we can sort of see this in Tina's clothes. One of the most interesting things to me is that she wears pants almost the entire movie. I don't believe that pants were very common in the 1920s. Um, I found a couple different types of pants. There's these ones, which are more for sportwear, not workwear. There's these ones, which are called beach pajamas. They are what you would wear to the beach, again, not work. I am pretty sure that Tina's pants are more inspired by the 1930s than the 1920s. We can see women like Katherine Hepburn wearing similar pants in the 1930s, so that's probably where that came from. Tina also wears a necklace the entire time, and I'm not quite sure what the significance of that is, but um, it looks nice, so good for her. The first outfit that Tina wears is a white blouse with her black pants, a long grey jacket, a blue-grey sort of coat, and a cloche hat. I like the coat that she wears, it has a tall collar so that Tina can sort of hide behind it like we see her doing in the movie. I also really like her blouse, uh, this sort of style of blouse was popular from the 1910s in the 1920s and I really wish I had one like it. The clochette that Tina wears is also an important piece of 1920s fashion history. Clochettes were popular with the sort of new short hairstyles that a lot of women had so they were very common at the time. The second outfit that Tina wears is her pajamas. They're very simple, they're light blue, they also have pants, so you can see that Tina seems to prefer a more masculine style. I also think they age pretty well. If you saw someone wearing them today, you probably wouldn't wonder if they were wearing 100-year-old pajamas. Um, I think they are very nice. Tina is still wearing her pajama top in the next scene, but other than that, it's a pretty similar outfit to what we've seen before with her black pants and her gray jacket. It's just missing a couple of layers. She next wears a burgundy red sort of evening dress which has these bead designs that I think look like clouds. Atwood said that it's actually based on a real 1920s dress that she found. She liked the top of it, but decided to um, change the bottom of it. Although we don't really see the bottom of the dress in the movie. 
The waistline is pretty low, typical for a 1920s dress, and the hemline goes to just below Tina's knees. Tina's hair also is a little bit wavy in this scene, and it seems to sort of stay that way for the rest of the movie. The dress is pretty different from anything else Tina wears throughout the rest of the movie in both color and style, but it looks absolutely amazing. Tina then changes back into her previous outfit, although she's replaced the pajama top with another white blouse. So, pretty much the same outfit as before. Tina's last outfit in the first movie is another white blouse, a black skirt, and a blue-black sort of coat. I can't quite tell what color it is. She's also wearing these adorable little boots. I would love to have them. I think they are so cute. <laughs> The blouse has a necktie, which was a popular style in the 1920s. While she's still wearing her usual color palette, Tina isn't really hiding behind a coat or a cloche act. She looks very happy in this scene. In the second movie, Tina, like everybody else, is wearing darker colors. She also has a new haircut, a short bob with bangs that I think looks a lot like Louise Brooks. She's wearing a long dark blue trench coat, which was apparently quite heavy. She's wearing a similar color palette um, as she was in the previous movie, but her clothes are a little bit more professional now. She's moved up in her job, and you can see that in her clothing. She also still has the tall collar on her coat, which she can sort of hide behind as she does her job. Underneath the coat, she is wearing, you guessed it, another white blouse and a similar pair of the same black pants. Queenie is honestly the most fashionable character in the movies, but maybe I'm just biased because she wears so much pink. She's Tina's younger sister, but she dresses quite differently from her. She wears a lot of feminine clothes, she wears a lot of sheer things, pink things, and all of her outfits are amazing. They're all so cute. She has a short curly bob, which was a popular style at the time. It reminds me of both Clara Bow and also this drawing, which I think is very funny because of the, the title, so I thought I would share. We first see Queenie in a short pink slip with black lace and a sheer black jacket shawl thing. We very clearly can tell that she's very feminine and sweet from what she wears. At would even compare her to Marilyn Monroe. She then puts a navy blue dress over top the pink slip. It has long sleeves and a deep v-neck in both the front and the back. I'm pretty sure the bottom is asymmetrical, but it's a little bit hard to tell. The dress looks more like an evening dress than a day dress to me, but I guess you could just say that's because Queenie likes fancy things, or maybe it was just to make her look a little bit more witchy and magical. I think it's interesting that they chose a dark blue color for this dress for Queenie, because it either is supposed to match her to her sister, which this is a color she wears often, or it's supposed to just have her fit in with the rest of the general aesthetic of the movie. The next step that we see Queenie in are her pajamas. They are very different from Tina's, but just as adorable. She's wearing a pink slip with a bow on it and a sheer pink shawl jacket again. Unlike Tina's, they are definitely of the time, very 1920s, but that just reflects how fashionable I think Queenie is, and that just makes them even better. Over top her blue dress, Queenie wears a pink coat. Atwood said about it, The coat I had designed for her was woven out of 30,000 feet of silk thread and all different ombre shades of peach. I thought it looked like a sunset or sunrise with an element of air and light that I liked for Queenie. I'd say that the coat looks like a pretty regular 1920s coat, other than maybe the waistline, which is a bit higher than usual for the 1920s silhouette. Queenie also wears an evening dress like Tina. Hers is pink, sparkly, made of sheer fabric. It has these very pretty uneven sleeves. Uh, the hemline is a little bit shorter than Tina's. It has a low neck with a crisscross, and it, it's, it's very, very Queenie. Watching the movie, I really enjoy looking at Queenie's bright, colorful outfits compared to everybody else. They stand out, but in a very good way. The last outfit Queenie wears in the first movie is a plain pink turtleneck with what looks like her navy dress over it again. She's also wearing a pink coat, although I don't think it's the same one she was wearing before. I think it's just similar. She also has an adorable pink hat, which I believe is a Tam O'Shanter hat, as it's a little bit different from a beret. This style of hat comes from Scotland. It used to be worn by both men and women, but in the 1920s, it became very popular among younger women, especially after Clara Bow wore it. In the second movie, Queenie wears darker colors, unsurprisingly. She wears the same outfit almost the whole movie, which is honestly pretty disappointing. I wish we could have seen her in 
at least some more things. If we couldn't have the bright pink costumes, I wish we could have at least seen her in a couple more outfits. The dress that Queenie wears for most of the second movie is a plaid dress. It's in darker colors. She does occasionally wear it with this pink coat, but again, it's a darker pink. The colors just look so sad, and I know that's the point, but I just, I missed bright colorful costumes, you know? Atwood said that Queenie would dress according to where she was going, so she thinks that this sort of plaid dress would be what Queenie would wear, you know, to visit England, to visit Newt. I think that's a pretty cute idea, I like that. Although the dress is clearly more 1930s inspired than 1920s, I believe Atwood even based it off of a real 1930s dress. Um, we can see a lot of costumes in the second movie are more 1930s than 1920s. We also see Queenie at the very end of the movie for just a couple seconds. She's wearing a black dress with white designs, which is interesting because we've never really seen her in a black dress. I suppose it's to show us, oh no, she's evil now. Although the majority of this video is about the costumes and not the plot of the movies, I feel that I should at least mention this. Queenie and Tina are Jewish, which JK Rowling sort of alluded to on her Twitter. Is anyone surprised? Queenie actually ends up joining Grindelwald at the end of the second movie, which a lot of people have pointed out is concerning to say the least. Queenie is not only Jewish, but she's engaged to a non-magical person and Grindelwald wants to, I don't definitely doesn't want to be friends with these non-magical people. It doesn't make any sense and also it's a little bit harmful to say that Queenie would join this man who is easily comparable to another man of the time. I don't think it should have been in the movie and I just I thought I should mention it just to say hey bad idea. <laughs> So I've talked about the four main characters, but there are plenty of other characters in these movies who have costumes just as interesting as Tina's or Queenie's. First of all, Madam President Serafina Pickery has a lot of very interesting costumes. The one I want to talk about is the one that she wears when she's talking to the International Confederation of Wizards. It's this long dark blue dress with gold details, the Makuza logo in the middle of it. It has these panels coming out from the sides of the dress around the hips. It's got long sleeves. It's, it's very, very, very fancy. She also wears a tall headdress that Atwood, I believe, based on an Indonesian wedding headdress that she found. And she's also wearing very tall shoes, which we can't see, but it makes her very tall. She has this very imposing presence among the rest of these already very powerful wizards. Well, I think this outfit isn't exactly 1920s, it's definitely more magically inspired. It is a very pretty dress, and I think it I think it does the job it needs to do. You can't really see her hair underneath the headdress except for this little curl that comes out on the side of her face, but it reminds me of Josephine Baker and other flappers, and I thought that was really cool. Percival Graves wears this long, elegant, sort of shimmery coat. Compared to Newt, it's very monochrome, very formal. He's meant to look very official. He's, you know, doing his job, or at least pretending, I guess. Apparently Grindelwald's outfit in the second movie is pretty important or holds a lot of significance, but I don't really like it. It's very militaristic, it has a lot of buttons, it's supposed to be still 1920s, but again, magically inspired, also inspired by the Alpine region and rock stars. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I guess it, it does its job. It's just not as interesting as Newt's costume, I would say. Little Lestrange wears a very, very pretty 1930s inspired purple gown. She also has this sort of cape on the back of her dress, which at would say she based off of a similar true vintage item, which I thought was really cool because it's it's still magical, but it was also something that actually existed. Atwood also mentioned that the stylish and high class look that this dress has is supposed to be a reference to Lita's background. You know, she's a very stylish woman. She um, is a very important woman. She's one of the Lestranges, so. Lita's hair is actually tied up in the back and cut in the front, which is something that a lot of women in the 1920s would do when they didn't want to commit to cutting their hair off, so I thought that was a really cool detail. She also wears a matching purple hat for one scene, and it looks like it takes inspiration from both 1920s hats and 1930s hats, but the coolest part about it is that it's pointy and it looks like a witch hat, and I thought that was a really 
smart idea. I think it looks very good. I think it matches and I think it fits into this world very well. Newt's brother Theseus wears clothes that are comparable to Newt's but much more official and formal and boring. <laughs> Theseus has a very respected job and even if he wants to dress a little bit less formal, he dresses this way so that he will get the respect that he deserves in this job. I guess I should also talk about Dumbledore, but I am going to say that it just it doesn't make sense for him to be dressed like that. <laughs> like I've already talked about, you can explain why the American witches and wizards are wearing these very casual, normal 1920s clothes, but it doesn't make as much sense for European witches and wizards to be wearing these same sort of 1920s clothes. The Harry Potter world has already made it clear that witches and wizards don't know how to dress like non-magical people, and especially Dumbledore. You could just say, oh well, he's just trying to blend in. And I would like to point out in the Harry Potter movies, about 10 years after this movie takes place, there's a flashback in which Dumbledore not only looks 50 years older, but he is wearing just the worst outfit I've ever seen. And he's also wearing it around Hogwarts. And it's like, well, why isn't he wearing wizard clothes like he has been and we assumed he had always been? I don't know. Even if he's wearing this very nice 1920s outfit, it looks good, it just doesn't make any sense. I don't really get it, but if Atwood wants to disrespect the previous world building that JK Rowling has just set up, then you know what? She can. There are plenty of other beautiful costumes from both side characters, background characters. I know I missed important ones, especially Credence. I didn't talk about him, so I apologize. The costumes in the Fantastic Beasts movies may be pretty inconsistent and confusing compared to the rest of the Harry Potter world, but that doesn't mean that the characters aren't stylish. Feel free to tell me anything I may have missed or gotten wrong or anything I should have probably included. There is definitely plenty of it. Feel free to like or subscribe. I'm planning on making more of these in the future, hopefully. Uh, thank you for watching. Bye!